And let's pray for God's help as we look at his word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, which is living and active. We pray you'd speak to us this morning and teach us what life is all about. Uh, Please would you show us wonderful things. And may we not only hear your word, but obey it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what is life all about? What is the meaning of life? I tried asking Siri that question this week, see if she'd help me with my sermon. Uh, Siri is the the little thing on an iPhone, if you've got an iPhone. If you've not got an iPhone, you'll probably find on Google there's something similar. But anyway, Siri told me, first of all, 42, of course, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's, uh, I think, where she got that from. I tried again, that wasn't the most helpful. What is the meaning of life? What's it all about? And she said this, my friend says the answer is blowing in the wind. Take a deep breath. Spend some time outside. Perhaps you'll find something there. So I went outside and I took a deep breath. But I didn't find the meaning of life as I stood on the doorstep in the rain. I tried again. And she said, nobody really knows. Try smiling. So I tried. And it didn't tell me the meaning of life. How would you answer it? What is it all about? Well... Ecclesiastes and children, this is number one on the the service sheet. There's a book there. You've got to fill in the the, the answer. Uh, Ecclesiastes is wrestling with this question. What is life all about? What is it about? And he's dealt with the frustrations of life and the shortness of life. And that frustration of when we look for meaning in things and it just slips through our fingers. And now at the close, the preacher is going to tell us what life is all about. See if he's any better than Siri. But first, before he tells us what life is all about, he he writes his own blurb, if you like. You know, like you get on the back of a book that tells you what's inside it, why you should read it, a little taster for the book, why you should read it. And he tells us why we should read it. And he says, first of all, and this is number two on the sheet, children. He says, first of all, the writer is wise. Do you see in verse nine, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people that knowledge. Well, we might think that's a little bit boastful of him to say, isn't it? But the truth is, he knows his wisdom has come from God. The preacher is probably Solomon, that's who traditionally is understood to have read, written this book, Ecclesiastes, who God gave great wisdom to. He was the most wise man uh, up until that point. And so, we should pay attention to what he's saying because he is a wise human being. A wise human author. But not only that, behind the human author is an even wiser divine author. So do you see what he says in his blurb at the end of verse 11? He says, uh, these collected sayings, they are given by one shepherd. Who is this one shepherd who gave this book? Well, you probably know Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. But it's not the only place God is described as the shepherd of his people. Psalm 80 calls God the shepherd of Israel. Our reading from Ezekiel told us God was going to be like a shepherd coming down to search for his people, to bind them up, to care for his people. And in that reading from Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, God said that the shepherd would be his servant David. Now that's a little bit confusing, isn't it? Because when uh, Ezekiel was written, David was dead. So you think, how can the shepherd be David? Well, it must be someone born in David's family. And who is born in David's family? Whose birthday are we going to be celebrating later on this month? Yep, Jesus. Born once in Royal David City. Born in the line of David. Jesus is that shepherd who came into the world to save us. To be the good shepherd who would lay down his life. For the sheep. And so in Ecclesiastes, we've not just got the voice of the preacher Solomon, but the voice of God and especially of our Lord Jesus Christ. That that means this is a book that we should pay attention to. Well, like all scripture, it's worth paying, paying attention to because in it we hear the voice of Jesus. And it's not just any old book. Like all scripture, it's carefully arranged. You see in verse 9. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people with knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. He's a master craftsman. 
He's done his work and it's paid off because here we are, 3,000 years later, looking at his words of wisdom. Just think of the beautiful words that we've read as we've gone through Ecclesiastes. I'd encourage you to read it again. But remember how it started with those wonderful words uh, in, in chapter 1 verse 4. A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. It's beautifully written, isn't it? Explaining that sense of life going around and around and the, the, the frustration. What, what's it all about? All those beautiful words we sometimes hear at a funeral. Chapter 3. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And here's the drumbeat. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. And again, beautiful words and poetry. Or chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, remember that these words. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. And he could have just said, well, you ought to do a bit of work. If, you, if you're able to work and you choose not to work, you'll end up hungry. But instead he gives us a wonderful picture of the foolish person who's not working and he has to eat his own flesh because he's got nothing else to eat. He, he paints these wonderful pictures so that we might remember them. Beautiful words, carefully arranged, but sometimes they sting. Why do they sting? Well, he tells us in verse 11, uh, back in chapter 12 and verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads. Are there any farmers here today? There are a few farmers. Do you know what a goad is? It's a cattle prod. That's what it is. It's, it was an ancient cattle prod. Uh, they didn't have the electric ones back then, but they'd have had a, a sharp stick, maybe with some nails in it, and they'd have prodded. The, you, you know what they're for. They're to keep the cattle on the straight path, aren't they? To, if they veer off to the left or to the right, you give them a, a prod or a whack uh, to keep them on the narrow path. How do they work? They work by inflicting pain. A little bit of pain to keep them, the sheep or the cattle, going in the way that you want them to go. And children, we're on to number three on the sheet. A true or false round for you to fill in. The aim is to keep those animals moving. And in this book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher says his words are a bit like that. They're a bit of a prod. They give us a bit of pain but to keep us on the narrow path. Some of his words have been hard to hear, haven't they? He has talked about the one thing that we don't talk about, death. He's mentioned it because we need to hear about it. He said in chapter 3, verse 19, For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. It's a bit of a prod, isn't it? It stings as he says it, but he says it so that we might learn how to live, so that we might learn how to make the most of the life God has given us, so that we might be ready for that day when we will face God. Or chapter 7, verse 20, Here, here's another prod. See how you like this one. Chapter 7, verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. That's a bit of a prod, isn't it? Do you think you're the exception? Do you think that you are the righteous man or woman who does good and never sins? No, you're not. It's a prod, isn't it? It's, it's a prod that says all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it's a prod to make us turn to our good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for the sheep. It's meant to drive us to Jesus. Or those words we heard back in chapter 5, where the preacher said, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they're doing evil. Here's another prod to say, God is a holy God. Be careful as you approach him. Well, do you recognise your shepherd's voice as we have this uh, book read to us? Our shepherd who says to us, enter through the narrow gate. For broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter on it. 
Our preacher, our, our, our uh, shepherd, who's, who warns us to be careful of false prophets who will lead us astray. People who will claim to speak for God, but will lead us astray. You see, Jesus prods his people. Jesus prods us to keep us on the right path, to enter on the narrow path, to come to him. Because he is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. One of the ways we can actually know we're hearing God's voice is when it challenges us. When we read the Bible or we hear a sermon and it challenges us, we can know God's speaking. He's challenging us. He's telling us. He's prodding us. He's giving us a bit of a goad. But the words aren't only goads. They're also nails. Now, have you ever been camping? Would you like to go camping on a day like today? Uh, as we're facing another storm. What do you do to keep your tent from blowing away? What do you do? Yep. You peg it down, that's right. You, and, and he's used the word nails, but he's talking about pegs. The shepherd, the wise shepherd, would put in pegs to hold his tent out. So he's saying his words are like goads that sting, but also they're like tent pegs or nails that give stability. His words give life stability. So he says that his words are, are painful, they sting, but they give stability. It's a bit like we saw last time. The, the preacher said, remove vexation from your heart. Don't worry. Don't be anxious because God's in control. Give your burdens to him. Whatever it is that's troubling you, that gives you stability, doesn't it? To know that God is in control. His words sting and they give stability. And they're given by one shepherd who loves us so much that he laid down his life for us. We can trust his word. His word is sufficient. And children, you might want to pay attention to verse 12 here, because I think you could use this to get out of homework. Have a listen to this. Verse 12. My son, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Imagine that, you're sitting down to do your homework, your mum's there beating you around the ears, telling you to get on with it, and you say, but much study is a weariness of the flesh. It says it in the Bible, there's a good excuse to get out of homework. Well, that's not what it's about, sorry, giving you a glimmer of hope. Uh, it's not saying there's no point in studying. What is he saying? He's saying, look, if you want to make sense of life, you don't have to read everything. You don't have to make sure you've checked out every single possibility you don't need to ask Siri everything. What do you need to do? There's enough wisdom in this book to help you to make sense of life. You don't need to read everything. In fact, what you need to do is settle on what is said here and obey it. Don't need to go everywhere and look for the answer everywhere. Here is God's word. And through this word, you can make sense of life. You don't necessarily have to read more, you just have to obey more. And that's where the preacher ends this great book. He ends by telling us what life is all about. Well, what is it? Is it 42? Is that where he's going to go? Is that the answer? The meaning of life is 42. Does he say, go outside and breathe and you'll find something? Does he say, go and try smiling? No, what does he say? Here it is, verse 13, the end of the matter. All has been heard. Are you ready for it? What is the meaning of life? What's it all about? Fear God and keep his commandments. That is it. Fear God and keep his commandments. And children, that's over the page, number four on the sheet. You've got to cross out the X's and the Y's to find out what it, well, I've just told you. You can fill it in. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, he says. That, that is, this is what it's all about. This is the essence of what it means to be a human being. This is what life's about. Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, I wonder, what do you make of that? Does it, does it sound a bit restrictive? Our, our world certainly prefers to hear, be yourself. You can be who you want to be. Do whatever makes you happy. Our world prefers freedom and independence, not fear and keep God's commandments. 
We live in a world that says you decide, you get to choose. But are we happier? Do you think? Really? Is it better to say, well, life's about blowing in the wind? Could fear God and keep his commandments actually be a better answer for us? Perhaps the one who made us knows, after all, what is best. We've seen time and again in Ecclesiastes that life is like a vapour, like vanity. It's just like the mist that goes away in the morning. Life is so short. Try and grab hold of it and it'll escape you. Try and find meaning in it and it'll escape you. It'll be like striving after the wind. Try to find meaning in wealth or health or entertainment, pleasure. It'll slip through your fingers. You see, you and I are made for a relationship with our creator. And without him, we will not find true meaning. But if we fear God, and this is number five on the sheet, children. If we fear God, uh, which means to to stand in awe before him, to recognise that he's our creator, that he is the powerful one, and that he knows what is best. If we fear him and keep his commandments, we will find joy. We'll find we're doing what we were created to do. We'll find life starts to make sense. If we see all of life as a wonderful gift from our loving Father, we will find purpose and meaning every day. Well, the preacher has wrestled with meaninglessness, with life under the sun. And he's painted a dark picture of what the world is like under the sun without reference to God. But time and again in the book, he's allowed a a glimmer of light to come in. Time and again, he's caused us to lift our eyes. And he said, just amongst the darkness, rejoice in the days of your youth. Remember your creator. Enjoy the life he's given you. He's given us this glimmer of hope into the darkness. He's told us to lift our eyes to the one who set eternity in our hearts. He's shown us that life is short, but that's not a reason for despair. You see, as he comes to the end of the book, he tells us that there's a judgment coming, and that's good news, because the fact that there's a judgment coming means that everything you do is significant. It's not meaninglessness. If there was no judgment, it wouldn't matter what Putin's doing, or what Hamas is doing, or what anyone else is doing. It just wouldn't matter. But we all know it does matter because we're heading to judgment. That means everything is significant. And so the preacher says, because you're heading for judgment, fear God and keep his commandments. Because, verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Well, I wonder, do you see God's judgment as a good thing? It probably depends on how you feel about God, doesn't it? If you haven't yet seen that God is your loving creator, who knows what is best and wants to give life, and who wants to give life meaning and joy, if you're still trying to find meaning without God, if you prefer freedom and independence you might not like the idea that God will bring every deed into judgment. Well, if that's the case, would you let the preacher give you a prod this morning with his cattle prod, with his goad? You see, the preacher says judgment is coming. And God has the right to judge you because he made you. And he's told you and me how to live. He's given us his commandments, which are for our good, not for our harm. Just think how good those commandments are. They're for our good. They're to give us life, to protect people from being hurt. His ways are best. Would you let the coming judgment lead you to fear God? To let that goad be a sting that gives you stability? Because when we admit we've not kept his commandments, we're driven to the good shepherd, that one shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep so that we can be forgiven, so that we can face God's judgment with confidence. You see, when you trust Jesus, 
you can look forward to that judgment because you know your sin is covered and you can then get on with living life in grateful obedience to God who gives meaning to all of life. Our children, we're on to the last question, number six uh, on the sheet. So this is the meaning of life. Fear God and keep his commandments. It, it's quite simple, isn't it? What would it look like for you when you're milking the cows later on today? How, how does it look different for a farmer that fears God and keeps his commandment to a farmer who doesn't fear God and keep his commandments? It would probably look very much the same, wouldn't it? They'd both get the job done. But what would be going on in the heart of the farmer who fears God and keeps his commandments? Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm not a farmer. But I imagine it would be something like this. That, that you know that God's with you as you're there milking in the dark and the cold. That you can thank God for your health and the ability he's given you to, to be able to do it. Thank him for the, mach- the machinery you have that he's given you. Thank him for the livestock that you have. And praying that this milk would satisfy the person who's going to drink it. And that they in turn would glorify God, thanking God for his goodness in giving them that milk. I don't know, that's just one idea. What about the children at school? What would it look like for you to fear God and keep his commandments? Well, it might affect how you treat others at uh, playtime, when you're outside in the yard. It might affect how you get on with your work. Because even when you don't want to do the work, you remember That you're working for the Lord and not for men. Doing everything for his glory. Seeking to please him. What is the meaning of life? It is to fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Well, because judgment is coming and everything therefore matters. But for the Christian, this isn't a matter of despair. For all our sin is covered. And God wins and he will do what is right. And so if we've allowed Jesus to prod us onto that narrow path that leads to life, our future is unbelievably good. Let's pray as we close this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this book of Ecclesiastes, for the wisdom contained in it that makes us stop and think about life and where it's heading. We pray the fact we're heading to judgment would give each one of us a sense of meaning and significance. We pray that it would be the the goad that we need to drive us to you. That we might live all of our days in your fear and to your glory. Keeping your commandments, knowing that that is what life is all about. It's about going your way. Please help us. In Jesus' name. Amen.